God answered prayer. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. God answers prayer. Amen. We're grateful for that. If you have your Bibles, I want you to look with me in Matthew, the 16th chapter. I want to pick up on a series that we began a couple of weeks ago. And evidently, God thought the series needed to be interrupted because we had a snow day last week. And um, I hope you still were able to tune in to the online service that we did present. We shared a message online about how God's grace is enough. And it is, my friends. It is enough. If for some reason you missed that, you can go back um, to our website, godisgoodonthehood.com, work your way through that, or get on YouTube and you can find that. And if that will help you, if it did help you, um, I'm glad that he was able to. But we want to pick up today where we were sharing out of Matthew, the 16th chapter. A couple of weeks ago, we shared about how Jesus was having a discussion with his disciples. It's recorded in Matthew, chapter 16. And he asked them, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And the popular opinion was some think you're this prophet or that prophet or the other prophet. And Jesus wasn't faced by that. Okay? I want you to understand something today. I understand the importance of opinion polls and the value of those in certain instances. But I want you to know, I don't care what the opinions are about Jesus. He knows who he is. And he's unchangeable. Okay? So he wasn't as concerned for his sake about who people were saying he was, but for their sake. He then looked at his disciples and he brought it down. He narrowed the focus from the masses to the few, to the individual, if you will. And that's what God always does. He came to save the world, and that world includes you, and it includes me. He then posed the question to his twelve, but who do you say that I am? Peter got it right. He spoke for himself, and maybe for the rest, but definitely for himself. And he said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. You're the promised one. You are the man. You're the one. And look at Jesus' response in Matthew 16, 18. Well, actually, before that, he says, Blessed are you, Simon Marjona, for flesh and blood is not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And in verse 18, he goes on to say this. And I also say to you that you are Peter. And on this rock... I'm going to build my church. Notice this verse. If you've never read it before, you need to read it again. If you've read it before, you need to underline it. If you've got it underlined, you need to memorize it. And if you've got it memorized, you need to pay attention to it again. Jesus said to Peter himself, You got it right, buddy. And by the way, I know your name's Peter. And on this rock, not the rock of Peter, but the rock of the statement of faith that he had just made that Jesus is the Messiah. He said, upon this rock, I'm going to build my church. How many of you are aware that when you build a building, the the foundation is a non-negotiable negotiable entity in any building project, okay? It doesn't matter how nice of a home or a structure you make, if you mess up the foundation, it's all in vain. If you have a faulty foundation, the whole thing's going to crumble. And if, uh, if you've ever had an experience with foundation problems, you know what I'm talking about. Um, one of the most famous buildings in the world that I think of when it comes to foundations is a tower that was built nearly eight centuries ago that was referred to as the Tower of Pisa. As a kid, I called it the Tower of Pizza, and I wished it had pizza all over it, you know. But it is the Tower of Pisa in Pisa, Italy. And it was built, uh, and part of what it was, it's, 
responsibilities or its use, its function was going to be was to hold the bell for the Catholic Church. But there were some problems with this particular building, and it became better known to us as the Leaning Tower of Pisa. And basically, they did a poor job on the foundation work of this building. That, coupled with some subterranean soil shifts, caused the building to lean, as you see it in this picture, almost uh, five, uh, five and a half degrees at one point. Now, you might be thinking, that's no big deal. What's five and a half degrees? If the building we were sitting in was leaning five and a half degrees, we would all know it. If it was going this way, nobody would be sitting over here much, okay? We would all be hanging out over here with the man clan, right? And, and here's the thing. They did extensive work over a couple of decades on the Leaning Tower of Pisa to correct the foundation, but they were only able to correct it to move back to approximately four degrees of a lean to it. And that made it to where it could be habitable again. People could go in and out of it. And you might think, well, okay, 3.99 or four degrees, what, what big deal is that? Well, at the bottom of it, it might not be that big a deal, but when you get to the top of it, it's, it is offset by 13 feet. Well, what's the big deal about 13 feet? Well, imagine Jeremy Connor coming up here and me standing on Jeremy's shoulders. And after me climbing up Jeremy and spending half a day doing that, and standing on his shoulders, if I could balance on top of his shoulders, if I held my hand up like this, on top of Jeremy's shoulders, that might be 13 feet. That's the difference from the base and the lean at the top of the building as you see it right there. Now just for fun information today, modern engineering has done some feats that's enabled us to have buildings that lean even more than this and they're still secure because the foundation is secure. The building you see pictured there is the Capitol Gate building in Abu Dhabi and as of 2010, I think this record still holds, uh, it is the world's furthest leaning man-made tower, and it tilts a full 18 degrees, just for whatever that's worth. And if you look at this graphic real quick that compares the two buildings, there's an 18 degree tilt in that building versus a four degree tilt in the leaning tower of Pisa. So what's the difference between those two buildings and the tilt, other than the degrees of tilt? The newer building is standing firm. Why? Because the foundation has been built better. When you have the right foundation, the building can stand. If the foundation's faulty, it's all going to come tumbling down. And Jesus said to Peter, my church has a foundation. And that foundation is the statement of faith that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. I want you to hear me today, my friends. It is important for us to know and to understand that the organization that we're a part of is not just the first church of God on Mahood Avenue that has connections with the Reformation movement of the church of God in Anderson, Indiana. The organization that you were born into is the church of the living God and it's built on the surest foundation of anything ever thought of by man. We stand on that firm foundation. 1 Corinthians, the third chapter, beginning at verse 9. These verses will come up on the screen for you. The Bible declares that we are God's fellow workers and you are God's field and you are God's building. According to the grace of God which was given to me as a wise master builder, I've laid the foundation and another builds on it, but let each one take heed how he builds on it. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Hear me today. The, the one who has built the church, the church of the true living God, is none other than Jesus Christ himself. And he is that chief cornerstone. Now, I am keenly aware 
that I get the honor and the privilege of being the pastor of the First Church of God on the Hood Avenue at this point in history. And every time I walk down this hall just outside of my right, I see one woman and several men whom God has worked through down through 121 years to make this congregation what it is today. I realize beyond a shadow of any doubt that I'm not the first one to come along and pastor this church. And if the Lord tarries and I live long enough and, and this church outlasts my living, I won't be the last pastor to pastor this church. I hope to be here a long, long time. I hope to retire here. And I don't plan on retiring early. So don't misread what I'm saying. I have no plans of going anywhere anytime soon. I'm just simply trying to put it into perspective here. What I understand is that what was built that started in 1900, that is the first church of God as we know this congregation... It's been in existence for 121 years, and I'm not the first one to come along and try to help build this church. There have been great people, men and women, who've been a part of that, that process of building it. And I know this particular facility that we're worshiping in today, it's literally built on a rock, isn't it? That is one of the most intriguing things about this building. You look out around here, there's rock everywhere. And if you go down to the rock room, you will literally see part of the corner, kind of back in this area right here, there's a rock that we just built around when this building was constructed. I like telling people, yeah, I got the church that's really built on a rock. <laughs> but it's built on more than just a piece of stone down in the rock room. You see, this church is built upon Jesus Christ being Lord. And hear me today, the second that it ceases being built upon that foundation, I don't care how sound the structure may be, it's not a church. It's not a church. It's simply a building where people gather to be encouraged or maybe fight every now and then. Now, we don't fight, I know. But if Jesus isn't Lord, there'll be a lot of fighting going on. The church is built upon Jesus Christ. Jesus said that uh, upon this sure foundation, he would build his church. The term church in the Greek is called ekklesia. It is the called out ones. It is God calling us out of a life of sin and calling us into a fellowship of believers who are striving to be like Jesus. This thing called the church is, is also described in the Bible as the body of Christ. In Ephesians, the first chapter, verses 22 and 23, the, Paul writes to the Ephesians and he says, He's put all things under His feet, and He gave Him to be the head over all things to the church, which is His body, the fullness of Him who fills all in all. The church is not just an organization of people who gather up on Sundays and Wednesdays and whatever other day of the week. The church is the literal body of Christ. And it is people who make up the members of this body. 1 Corinthians 12, 27 says, Now you are the body of Christ and you are members individually. Thank God every born again believer is a part of God's body, of God's church. Amen? If you've ever been a part of a system where people had to vote on you to become a part of the church, I, I'm sorry for that. Amen. You became a part of the church the day you got saved. Amen. Jesus made you a member. Amen. Jesus made you a part of the body. And He gave you unique giftedness uh, and, and, and talent so that you could function in that body in a way that brings Him glory. Now hear me today. If you've been under a system where, again, that you thought somebody had to vote you into the church, I apologize for that. That's not biblical. But if you were raised to believe that you're a part of the church simply because you grew up in the church and you show up at the church, I'm sorry to tell you that's not exactly true either. To be a part of the true church of God, you got to be born again. And if you had a mama and a daddy who loved Jesus and followed Him, and a grandma and a grandpa who loved Jesus and followed Him, thank God for that. But you've got to decide for yourself. You've got to say like Peter did for yourself, You're the Christ, the Son of the living God, and I believe on you for myself. That's what makes you a part of the body of Christ. 
Now we're all members, we who are born again are members of the body of Christ, of the church, the church of the living God. But we've got to remember, we who are members, that Christ is the head of this body. Colossians 1.18 says, And He uh, is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things He may have the preeminence. While each believer has an important role in the body, and I don't ever want to minimize that, I don't want us to overstate it either and get above ourselves and think we're more important than Jesus. If your life isn't built on the foundation of Jesus, or if this church isn't built on the foundation of Jesus, it's going to crumble. There's a foundation that we're built upon today. And Jesus said something about this church that... That he is building. He said that the church he builds can withstand anything. Look at verse 18 again in your Bible. He said specifically, I say to you, you are Peter. And upon this rock I want to build my church. And the gates of what? The gates of Hades or hell itself cannot stand against it. I want you to hear me clearly today. The church that Jesus is building is unstoppable. The church that Jesus is building is unshakable. When Jesus said the gates of Hades or hell or the place of the departed spirits itself cannot stand against it. What he is saying in essence is that all of the departed spirits, all the powers of death and destruction cannot stand against my church. It encompasses all the forces that oppose Jesus Christ. There's nothing that can stand against this organization that's called the church because it's built on the most solid foundation that can ever be found. Now I'm telling you that today. But some of us ain't living... Like we believe that. I'm telling us that today. But some of us have been shaken by the things that are going on in our world. Now, understand me today. I know there's a lot going on. I know there's a pandemic that started nearly two years ago that we all wish should go away. Amen? And it's shaking our world. I know that there's political unrest in our nation and in the world. That's shaking our world. Amen. I get it that there are interruptions that have come that we didn't want and we didn't ask for. And that could shake our world. I know what it's like to uh, (laughs) get sick unexpectedly. That shakes your world. I understand if you've lost a loved one recently. When that happens, that shakes our world. Jesus didn't say that the gates of hell would not try to shake our world. What Jesus said is it's not going to prevail against it. The world itself is always going to try to shake the foundation of the church. But here's the great news. It's an unshakable foundation. Nothing can prevail against it. Now hear me clearly today. The Republicans... Cannot shake the church. The Democrats cannot shake the church. The independents can't shake the church. Marxism couldn't shake the church. Communism couldn't shake the church. Any political system that's ever existed that went against the things of God, that oppressed the people of God, it could threaten the church. It could try to exert authority over earthly things, but it could not and it will not, nor will it ever shake God's church. It's an unshakable foundation. And if that's the case, 
We better start living like that. Now let me be clear today. Just because we're on an unshakable foundation, it doesn't mean that the devil is not going to try to shake us loose. You see, at the base of the Leaning Tower of Pisa, things are seemingly secure. But you're 13 feet off up here, kind of hanging on the edge and thinking you might going to fall, right? I'm telling you, you don't have to. And the enemy today is trying to shake the church. Satan is trying to attack us in three key areas. And some of us have been shaken loose and given in to some of this thinking. Let me cover these three things real quick and we'll be done. Three areas where the enemy's trying to shake us loose. The first is this. It's the demon of addictions. There are addictions that are running rampant in our land. And I, I want to be clear today. I'm not making fun of anybody who finds themselves addicted to something. I've been addicted to nicotine back in the day. I know what it's like uh, growing up in the county. A buddy of mine gave me all the smokeless tobacco I wanted until I got hooked. Then he expected me to buy it for myself and to pay him back. Okay? That's dipping snuff in case, you know, smokeless tobacco wasn't clear enough for you. Uh, I dip snuff, and if you smoke, you get addicted to nicotine by being absorbed through your lungs. If you dip snuff, you're absorbing nicotine directly into your bloodstream through the gums, and it is even an even stronger addiction. It was a pretty serious deal for me, okay? In my teen years, I dipped that mess, and that's what it is. It's mess, okay? You put, when it changes the color of your spit to that color that it changes, you know, can I get a witness for anybody who ever accidentally picked up a Coke bottle and thought they was getting Coke and they got somebody's tobacco spit? Yeah. Come on. Tell me that's good stuff right there. Yeah. No, it's disgusting. Listen, I understand at least to a certain level what addiction can be. And I can remember I was good at quitting dipping snuff. I quit a hundred times. Right? I know what it's like to think you've got power over something like that and come to find out it's got power over you. And before you know, what you thought you controlled is controlling you and you are chained. And I've watched people. You know, whatever you think about tobacco, that's your business. But I've watched where people got addicted to drugs. I don't make fun of them. I just know that addiction is real. And when drugs get a hold of somebody, they will do crazy things. They will steal from their family. They will steal from their friends. They're not controlling that. It's controlling them. And I'm telling you today, the gates of hell do not prevail against the church. If you're a believer today, you can get victory over the demon of addiction. Now, you might need, you, you definitely need to pray. You definitely need to get right with God. You might need to go to some program that will help you deprogram from your addiction. There's no shame in that. There's nothing wrong with that. I'm just telling you there's help and there's, there's power over that in the name of Jesus Christ. I've seen people get addicted to alcohol. They can't get along without it. They've got to have it to cope. I'm here to tell you today, you can live your life full and free from alcohol addiction in the name of Jesus Christ. And you'll be a whole lot happier without that mess. Yeah, that's the truth. Yeah, and quite honestly, a bigger addiction as important and as significant as drugs and alcohol addictions are, the biggest addiction running rampant in America has nothing to do with chemicals. It has to do with pornography. There are people of all ages, of both genders, people inside the church and outside the church who have gotten addicted to porn. And if you are trying to trick yourself into thinking it's okay to be a Christ follower and look at a little bit of that every now and then, that can be found in the meat market at Kroger's. It's called baloney. There's nothing redeeming about that. It exploits women and men, and it's ruining your mind. 
I'm not trying to make fun of you. I'm simply trying to tell you there's a better way. And pornography does not stand against the church of Jesus Christ. Drug addiction does not stand against the church of Jesus Christ. And the children of God can and will have victory over this. There's help for you in Jesus' name because your life is built on a firm foundation. The demons of addiction cannot shake the foundation of the church. The doctrines of deception cannot shake the foundation of the church. Oh, they're trying to. We live in a time and in a land that's trying to convince us, you know what, there are a whole lot of ways to heaven, Ray. It's okay that you believe in Jesus. You believe in Jesus all you want to. That's your truth. But you see, my truth is I want to believe in X, Y, or Z over here. Well, you know, from you know, being the laid back person that I am, there's a part of me that would like to believe that. Hey, you do you, I'll do me, and we'll all just be happy, right? I'd like to subscribe to that. It's, there's just one problem. It's not what Jesus said. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and nobody comes to the Father except through me. Hear me today. The enemy of your soul will try to whisper to you and try to convince you in the name of tolerance that it's okay to accept this belief or that religion or whatever. I'm not trying to make fun of anybody's religion. While I respect your right to believe what you want, I respectfully disagree with you and stand on the Word of God and declare to you today that Jesus is Lord. And He is the Christ, the Son of the living God. I didn't come up with that idea. I submit to it myself. Jesus is the way. We live in a time where another deception that's running rampant has to do with the whole idea of gender, gender identification, and sexuality. I want you to hear me today. This is being shoved down our throats. You can't watch a television show that's not highlighting transgenderism or the LGBTQ community or anything like that. It's coming up in every show I'm seeing on TV in some form or fashion. Now let me be clear again. I do not know what it is like to have gender dysphoria or anything like that. I don't know what it's like to struggle with same-sex attraction. That is not my reality. I'm not trying to make fun of, nor should you make fun of those who struggle with those things. But let me be clear on this as well. Don't buy into the idea that God made them that way. Don't buy into the idea that somehow it is acceptable and it's, it, we're supposed to just... Not only love them where they are, but accept them as they are and trust that, that, that God, you know, is just going to be okay with how they are. Listen, God wasn't okay with how I was. He changed me when I got saved. And if that happens to be your struggle or the struggle of someone you know, my heart goes out to you. But hear the word of the Lord. God made us a certain way. And he decries homosexuality and all those kinds of things as sin. I don't care what the enemy is going to try to bring against us. It's sin. And the church's reaction should be loving but firm. It is sin. Now, not only that. But if you read your Bible, you'll find out that the Word had a lot of other things to say about our sex lives. <gasps> did he just say sex? Yes, I did. And let me just make it very plain to you what the Word says. Sex is reserved for a man and a woman after they become husband and wife. You see, the church at large understands homosexuality is sin. But we've winked 
at fornication. Forn at who? Fornication. It's sex outside of marriage. And Jesus made it clear, no. You save that beautiful gift that God created. See, they didn't preach that when I was growing up. They just said sex was bad, don't do it. <laughs> then you get married and you're like, well, nobody told you. We didn't have good conversations about that part of it. And we won't get into details about that part of it, but sex was God's idea. But if you're going to get the most out of that wonderful experience, then you better follow the directions in the book. One man, one woman, after they're married, committed to each other and to God for life. Don't fool around with somebody you're not married to, but after you get married, fool around with them all you can. Y'all are laughing. The married people ought to be saying amen. All right, let's move on. The last doctrine of deception is feel-good religion. Feel-good religion. We live at a time where some of the people who stand in pulpits and on platforms and behind podiums Declare the word that if you love Jesus, everything's going to be hunky-dory and roses and rainbows and skittles and all that kind of good stuff. I'd like to believe that. I'd like to proclaim a blessing over you that guarantees that we're all going to be fat and rich and all that kind of good stuff, right? <laughs> Some of us been been received already, okay. I shouldn't have used that as an illustration. I apologize. <laughs> I would like to be able to declare over us today that none of us, even as Christ followers, will ever get sick. That none of us will ever have any struggles. It's just simply not true. Um, I believe as Christ followers, there are some things we may very well avoid. I think... I know beyond the shadow of any doubt, the best possible life you can live right now is as a Christ follower. Okay? And definitely the one to come. The, the heaven that we have to gain is way better than the hell that we want to shun. And I believe the best life between now and that point of us getting to heaven happens by following Christ. I don't believe it's always easy. I don't believe it's always storm free. I don't believe that it's always comfortable. But I believe it is best. And I stand opposed to anyone who would try to tell you or others that if you just believe, everything's going to be happy and fun all the time. It's simply not true. And if you submit yourself to that kind of teaching and you think that's the way it's supposed to be, here's what's going to happen to you. When somebody starts preaching something maybe akin to what I'm telling you today and it doesn't sit well with you, you're going to go find somebody else that says something else until you find the person who says what you want to hear. Paul called it people who had ears that wanted to be tickled. If you want your ears tickled, you're in the wrong place. If you want some free hand sanitizer, I can hook you up. But tickling your ears ain't happening here. Second Timothy, the second chapter. The word of the Lord says, Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun profane and idle babblings, for they will increase the more. And they will increase to more ungodliness. And their message will spread like cancer. Hymenaeus and Philetus are of this sort, who have strayed concerning the truth, saying that the resurrection is already past. And they overthrow the faith of some. Nevertheless, the, sure, the solid foundation of God stands, having this seal. The Lord knows those who are His. And let everyone, look at this last part, let everyone who names the name of Christ do what? Depart from iniquity. 
Hear me today. We're standing on the foundation of Jesus Christ. That He is the Son of the living God. You don't have to keep living in that mess called sin. God gives us victory over that. The last. We have the demons of, of addiction and the doctrines of deception. The last is this. Daily dilemmas. I don't know if you all know this or not, but life happens. It happens all around us. We, we know that, particularly over these last two years. Hear the word of the Lord. He who received the seed among the thorns is he who hears the word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches, riches choke the word out and he becomes unfruitful. Jesus told a parable about the seed being, th being sown among different soils. And it is this thorny soil, if you will, where the seed started to sprout up. But then because of, of daily dilemmas, people got discouraged and they left their faith. I don't know if you know this or not, but life is really pretty daily. I mean, you get up, you go to work, come home, get some supper. Yeah. If you got kids at home, you help them get their homework, if you can help them with their homework these days. You get things settled with them, try to get to bed, and you get up the next day, and what do you do? You go to work, get home, get some supper, help the kids get the homework, go to bed. What do you do the next day? A whole lot of the same thing. Life is very daily. And there are concerns that come up from time to time that are just kind of part of being a part of this world. My son and his, da his daughter, my son and his wife and their daughter, they're homeowners now. I talked to my son yesterday. You know where he was, what he was doing? He was going back on his second trip to Ace Hardware. <laughs> and you know what I told him? Welcome to home ownership, son. Son, why are you going back a second time? I thought I got the right size screw. Turns out I got the wrong size screw. Been there, done that. Now, Dad, I got the I sample screw of what I need. I'm taking it with me. You're a smart son. God be with you, okay? <laughs> Life happens. He had to pick up some topsoil to fill in some holes in his yard. You know why? Life happens. Babies bring joy to our world. And they also get sick. Life happens. Unexpected expenses occur. And that money you thought you were going to go out and have a good time with might have to be spent on something that you would rather not spend it on. You know why? Life happens. It happens to those who are saved and to those who are not saved. The snow falls on the homes of those who love Jesus as well as those who don't. You got to shovel some snow even if you love Jesus. That straight flat road going out to Beeson got six inches of snow on it. Thank God I got a four wheel drive. Okay? Listen, life happens. Jesus never promised that life wouldn't happen. What he promised is that no matter what happens, he'd be with us. And if we'll stand with Him, we'll be on an unshakable foundation. After Jesus preached the greatest sermon ever preached, He summed it up with this declaration. Matthew 7, 24-27 Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to the wise man who built his house on the rock. The rains descended, the floods came, and the wind blew and beat on that house. But it did not fall because it was founded on the rock, on that sure foundation which is Him. Jesus never said the rain or the snow wouldn't come on believers. He never said the wind would only blow against unbelievers. You know, I, I, I honestly have thought about this a lot. I wish mosquitoes only bit the lost. I lived in Louisiana for 24 years, okay? 
It would have been real nice if after you got saved, God just put this covering over you and said, nope, no mosquitoes can touch them. Then you'd really know who hadn't been living right. They'd be at church. Scratch, oh, what you been doing, right? It doesn't work that way, though. Mosquitoes bite believers and unbelievers. COVID can infect believers and unbelievers. Cancer can infect unbelievers and believers alike. All kinds of things can happen. Jesus never said the rains wouldn't come and the wind wouldn't blow and the floodwaters wouldn't rise. What he said was when you're built on the rock, you're going to stand. But he also warned in the next couple of verses that if you build on the shifting sand of this world, the rains are going to come in your life, the waters are going to rise and the wind's going to blow and you are going to crumble. Because it's going to overwhelm you. My friend, I've got a question for us today. Is your life built on that unshakable foundation that Jesus Christ is the Christ, the Son of the living God? And if He is your rock and your foundation, even though you're struggling, will you take assurance that you can stand firm? I also ask you this. If you've made Jesus your firm foundation, are you letting, are you willingly letting some things come in to erode that foundation? Are you willingly letting the enemy come in and dig up that foundation that Christ has already laid? Oh, my friend, if you make that choice, you're not going to stand. You're no longer on that firm foundation. You can choose today to be on that foundation and stay on that foundation. Isaiah 54, 17 gives us a great promise that there's no weapon formed against us that's ever going to prosper. And every tongue that rises against us in judgment, we will condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord and their righteousness is from me, says the Lord. Paul reminded us in 2 Corinthians 10, beginning at verse 3, that though we walk in the flesh, we don't war according to the flesh. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into the captivity of the obedience of Jesus Christ. As we walk in obedience to Him, we are standing on that foundation that is Him. And the gates of hell itself cannot and will not prevail against us. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? Our soul sisters are going to make their way forward. We're going to close this service out. And I'm going to simply ask you who are in the room and those who are watching online. Have you built your life on the foundation that is Jesus?